फाइव सेकेंड फाइव फोर थ्री टू वन सर वी आर लाइव नाउ नाउ वी कैन स्टार्ट द मीटिंग थैंक यू गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबडी Uh, welcome to this eighth session on this module of techniques in pediatric orthopedic trauma. Uh, today, uh, the session is on techniques in management of uh, femoral fractures, femoral shaft fractures, and we have uh, three senior faculty here with us. Uh, the first talk will be by uh, Gaurav sir from Jaipur. He'll uh, take on the techniques of hip spica for uh, um, shaft of femur fractures, followed by Vivek sir from Pune. He'll take the techniques of close reduction and nailing and shaft femur fractures, followed by Ashish sir from Pune on techniques and submuscular plating for the femoral shaft fractures. So we'll uh, start with Gaurav sir's uh, talk. Gaurav sir, you can share your screen, please. Right. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> good morning, Gaurav. And, uh... Good morning, sir. And all the speakers today. Thanks for your time. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining a little late. So I'm visible now. My screen is visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I'll start. So good morning. I would be talking about the pediatric femoral shaft fractures. And my job is to uh, give you an insight about the indications and the techniques of applying a spica. And since I'm the first speaker, I will give you a little bit uh, introduction also. So one of the great things about the pediatric orthopedics is the availability of variety of tools for treating the pediatric fractures. So with the femur fractures, we do have a number of options depending on the age and the size of the patient, uh, ranging from a pebbly harness to a spica to the rigid intramedullary nails. And I would restrict my talk to the application of standard hip spica. Now, American Academy has published a few uh, treatment guidelines in 2010 based on the age of the patient. Uh, which shows that children less than six months of age are usually treated with a pavlic harness. Six months to five years with a spiker cast. Five to 11, you can use uh, flexible intermediary nails. And beyond 11 years, you can go for a rigid fixation. But uh, the age should not be the only consideration while starting out the treatments for the pediatric femur fractures. So with, uh, prox uh, with femur fractures of children, there are multiple factors that determine our decision making. Uh, these include the characteristics of the patient, uh, that is the age of the child, the body weight. Uh, also, you might consider the intramedullary canal size. Characteristics of the fracture, like the what is the level of the fracture, what is the pattern, what is the combination. The characteristics of the injury, whether you have an open fracture or uh, like a polytrauma patient. And surgeons and patient preferences that might determine your treatment approach as well, such as using a spiker cast or a tense nail in a child around four to six years of age. Certainly, you have equipment limit limitations in some places that might change your treatment out, uh, approach. Now, this American Academy has put up guidelines in 2002, and they have updated in 2015 for the pediatric femur fractures. But the problem is that if you look uh, uh, if you look at the evidences for most of the treatment strategies for femur fracture, they are pretty poor or limited. So recently, uh, they have published on the changing trends in the pediatric femur fracture management. And this study was conducted for on almost more than uh, 4,500 patients in 50 large pediatric children's hospitals in USA. And what they have found is that there is a decreasing trend towards the use of spica casting in children up to six years of age. And there's an increasing trend towards the use of intermediary fixation in children uh, between four to six years of age. So uh, what they have concluded is that there's a recent increase in the utilization of internal fixation for the treatment of femur fractures uh, in younger children. And the intermediary nailing and the plate osteosynthesis has been used in increasingly over time for a patients aged four to six years of age. So uh, I think we need to reconsider our treatment guidelines, which was published in 2010, uh, wherein the six to five years of child, they are further divided into two categories. That is uh, the younger group up to two years of age, uh, the spiker casting is the line of treatment, whereas the children beyond the two years can, can be considered for the uh, flexible nails. Similarly, the trochanteric nail, which was earlier advocated after 11 years of age, can now be uh, done beyond uh, eight years of age. So there is no 
one treatment uh, method that is universally ideal uh, and it is very important to be familiar with the multiple options available if you are treating a child in adolescent age group for a femur fractures now uh, the the fractures are classified according to the ao classification uh, but for the treatment purposes it it it's bo boiled down to whether the fracture is a stable fracture or an unstable length stable or a length unstable fracture and the amount of shortening associated with it and the goal of management is to restore the alignment of the fracture uh, rockwood and green has uh, published a acceptable angulation criteria which shows that the closer you get to the skeletal maturity the less angulation is tolerated and so you need to treat these fractures uh, actively uh, now coming to our topic of hip spica casting whether it's a uh, uh, immediate spica after the fracture or delay it for a few days i think the good thing about the casting is that it requires a little hospitalization uh, just an overnight overnight stay would be good uh, relatively inexpensive and you can apply uh, them in sedation but i generally prefer to you uh, to apply them in uh, under ga now there are few relative contraindication uh, relative contraindication that is a shortening of more than 2 cm and an absolute contraindication is a high energy trauma or a polytrauma patient however it requires uh, the attention to details and subsequent follow up is mandatory now if there is a shortening of more than 2 cm of the initial x ray films and the fracture overlaps more than uh, 3 cm of gentle telescoping under ga and these are the candidates that are not suitable for an early hip spica and uh, you need to give traction before applying a hip spec for these patients so now uh, in order to put an effective hip spica we need to know what are the deforming forces acting on the fracture site so uh, uh, in this fracture pattern the proximal fragment drifts into the flexion and external rotation uh, now uh, this is a flexion and external rotation of the proximal fragment now if you look at the muscle forces around the site you will find that there are multi Uh, the the main muscle involved on the proximal fragment is the iliopsoas which produces a flexion and external rotation so the distal fragment has to be aligned with the proximal fragment so as to achieve a position of maximum relaxation so uh, the hip spica in this in these patients applied in a position of flexion abduction and external rotation uh, you we, we, we all know the rule of 30 degrees flexion abduction external rotation so as to achieve so as to align the fracture now another patient if you see a fracture pattern like this what you see that there is a adduction of the distal fraction and proximal fragment is in varus okay now uh, it is basically due to the combined combined effect of the adductors pulling the proximal fragment laterally and the medial hamstrings and the adductors pulling the distal fragment medially so in order to put a spica of uh, spica in a position of maximum relaxation not much abduction is needed as it will cause a more varus at the fracture site so a little abduction with a valgus mold is required so a single leg, leg spica single leg hip spica can be applied and also it avoids uh, getting into the position of ulnar paradox another patient where you see that there is significant shortening so what are the muscles involved here uh, it's basically a combination of the hamstrings posteriorly and the quadriceps anteriorly and so you need to do something to pull the fragments apart so you need to use a traction for few weeks before applying a, a hip spica and that is what is called as a delayed hip spica okay so uh, hip spica should be applied in a position of maximum relaxation it depends on the type of the fracture the configuration and the pattern of the fracture now coming to the variations of fracture we have different variations of hip spica uh, one and a half hip spica which is commonly given and it immobilizes the ipsilateral hip and the knee and the contralateral hip double hip spica it immobilizes both the knees along with the uh, uh, both the hips along with the knee and a walking hip spica is generally used for immobilization of uh, low energy length unstable fractures uh, in the younger children now the technique uh, now what are the materials which are required for the application of his hip spica and how to prepare them so you need to have a stockinets one a larger diameter for the torso and a smaller diameter for the legs uh, you need to have soft roll 6 inches and 4 inches at least 2 to 3 rolls plaster bandages 6 inches 4 inches at least 3 uh, or 4 rolls and one or two rolls of the fiber cast 
Now, the important determinant uh, for a good hip spica application is the need of a prolonged immobilization of the child during the pro process of cast application and which is achieved by using a unique table, what is called as a hip spica table. And ideally, it should be a user-friendly portable and the mounting and unmounting of the child on the table should be easy. So uh, there is no universally accepted uh, standard design available, but if you look at the different hip spica table, tables available in the market, whether they are company made or locally built or customized as per the surgeon's preference, they have the two main components that are common in all of them. That is a torso support or a spine support and a sacral support or a perineal post. Okay, I think at this point it's worth mentioning about the spica table which is designed and customized by uh, our Dr. Bolin Shah. And uh, it's basically a metal base, uh, uh, a, uh, a rectangular metal base with some pillar with three pillars and acrylic sheet over it. It's a triangular sheet. Uh, although I have not used it, but I think it's a good uh, spiker table, and everybody should have his have this in in his hoti hoti. However, uh, I use a very low tech e equipment, which is just a wooden plank of around uh, one uh, meter in length and thickness around one centimeters. You can use a le lesser width prank for a smaller children's, although it is not mentioned in the books, but I have used this. I've, I've seen this during my residency and since since then, then that I'm using this uh, wooden plank for it. Now, what is the position of the patient? The wood plank is placed perpendicular over the uh, uh, operating table and child is placed over the edge of the table with the lower body supported on the wooden plank which is slides underneath the child's buttock with the inferior edge of the plank at the level of the perineum. So you can see the red thing that is the wooden plank. <clears throat> now, an assistant, uh, uh, the assistant stands at the uh, foot end of the patient and holds the lower limb in the desired position of immobilization. And uh, another assistant stands on the head end and he stabilizes the wood plank. Now the stockinette is applied all over the trunk from nipple line superiorly to the inferior gluteal uh, gluteal fold posteriorly and the inguinal region. Also, uh, make sure that uh, the folded towel is placed, which which extends from the zippy sternum all the way inferiorly to the perineum. And uh, the small, the small, the smallest stockinettes are uh, rolled across the lower limbs. The cotton roll is applied all over the stockinette and two to three layers of the plaster of palace are applied. Pelvic part extends from the ziffy sternum superiorly to the uh, superior pubic region inferiorly. Avoid excessive pressure while rolling the bandages. And in the inguinal region, the cast is rolled in the figure of eight configuration uh, like this. And the thigh and the leg portions are then applied separately. Uh, in the, uh, the inguinal region and the knees are the common site of cast breakage. So the reinforcement of these regions with additional slab is important. The knee is reinforced with the 8 to 10 layers of plaster slab on the anterior aspect of the knee, while the inguinal region is reinforced with a transfer slab along the superior edge of the pelvic portion posteriorly, and then it is looped around the inguinal region to the posterior aspect of the thigh. Now, additional uh, plaster bandages are applied for completion and the patient is shifted on, onto the operating table. Uh, the plank and the abdominal padding is gently removed by sliding it proximally, and all the edges of the plaster are checked for padding. The stockinette is turned around, and the POP strips are applied to secure the uh, edges of the stockinette. Ensure that there should be enough space in the abdomen and for the perineal hygiene. At the end, you can reinforce it with one or two plaster bandages of the fiber cast for additional stability. I usually do it on the day of discharge because the plaster takes around uh, 24 to 48 hours to dry up. A smaller dry size diaper is applied covering the perineum and it is completely tucked, up, tucked inside the plaster. A larger size diameter is then applied over the perineum from outside. Uh, uh, in follow-up, check reduction weekly till three weeks. Uh, if the alignment is not acceptable, you can you can recast it or do a wedging, which is usually done at uh, at uh, second week. And remember, we can address the rotation. Remember, we can't address the uh, uh, rotational alignment once the cast is in place. So it is important to correct the rotational alignment at the first go. And the timing in the cast is often determined by a simple calculation by adding a patient's age in years and three weeks. 
and usually by eight weeks uh, it is the sufficient time by which the fracture heals. So so eight weeks is the maximum time in the cast, and particular in case of fractures. Uh, you need to educate the patients, uh, parents, counsel them and demonstrate about the proper cast care. Uh, frequent change in position is necessary and child should lie prone two to three hours during the day and night to avoid the pressure source. And diapers need to be checked every two hourly during the day and three, hour, three to four hourly during the night. And they must be changed as soon as they are soiled up. Now, the important thing is to place a pillow under the lower limbs. Uh, it prevents the anterior tilt of the superior edge of the plaster, which impinges on the lower back, and you might get a pressure so uh, because of that. Uh, skin care, mother should be advised to check the, for the redness, for the blisters, or for the sore under the cast. They can use a torch uh, to do that. And also, uh, they can be advised to put a spirit around the cast edges. Do not use any... Uh, uh, I think do not use any lotion or powder under the cast as they usually do uh, because it causes skin irritation and breakdown and do not allow them to stick any object inside the cast for itching also. Now the complications of the spica cast are pretty high which are close to 45% and we have all seen dirty spikas in the OPD and in the emergencies. Skin breakdown is probably the number one problem. But uh, you can lose reduction also either in a varus position or due to shortening. Peroneal nerve palsy is uncommon, but it is common in 1990 caste. And the caste has a significant impact on the family in terms of child lying in the bed for almost three to four weeks. And the superior mesenteric artery syndrome, I have not seen it. It is just for completion uh, where there is a partial or complete obstruction of the duodenum due to the tight plaster around the abdomen. So uh, coming to the conclusion, uh, it's unusual. It's a useful in immobilization method for the hip and femur pathologies in the pediatric age group, particularly for the fractures. A proper technique and attention to details are important to have a good spica, and complications can occur. And but should be watched for in the post application period, particularly the uh, skin skin source, plaster source, and uh, wound. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for the wonderful, exhaustive uh, talk on hip spikers. Um, so there's uh, one question, sir. Sir, in uh, children whom you do delayed hip spikers, sir, what kind of traction do you use? Is it a simple traction or a modified uh, Russell Hamilton or something? Uh, I think uh, the, the ideal is to give a modified Russell's traction. But uh, generally now, I think uh, we don't have a setup or uh, to have a Russell's traction. So we, ju we just give a simple traction for like uh, maybe week or so. And once the fractures, uh, once the shortening is, uh, is reduced, then we can apply a, a normal hip spike. Up. But the ideal thing is to give a Russell's traction. Uh, uh, it's, it's way back there using, but uh, we don't have a, a setup for the Russell's, uh, Russell's traction. Okay. Yeah, so that, that was a nice talk. Uh, Jonas, do we have any other question? No, sir. Not as of now. Yeah, so a few su uh, suggestions for uh, uh, this. Putting pillows below the uh, leg while applying uh, spica, what you should do is whatever angle of flexion you need to align the uh, proximal and distal fragment, you know, sometimes you might need 70 degree of flexion sometimes you might need 60 degrees of flexion try to uh, bring the heel and the buttock at one level okay yes. and then you can use a, a longer wooden plank to make sure that uh, the heel okay. lies at the level of buttock and then when you put the child on the floor on the bed uh, that will be at the same level. So the plaster will not impinge either on the front or back of your tummy. So that is uh, how I teach my fellows to uh, apply plaster. Right. So the amount of hip flexion will decide the amount of knee flexion also. So that is one point. The second point is uh, this wooden plank thing is also very good. Many people are using. I have seen them. I... Uh, uh, I have seen people carrying those wooden planks 
to different places in their uh, car dicky wherever they go for hip dislocation surgery and so on now those who are registering for posicon 2025 as a smart early bird registrants we are going to give this uh, hip spica table as a gift which is worth 5000 rupees and uh, uh, it is modular so uh, can i share my uh, if you can stop sharing your screen gaurav i'll share my screen and show you guys yes and uh, of course, we have published this and we have recently we did Spica in a nine years old after DDH where the body weight of patient was around 50 kilograms. So Gaurav, you can share your, uh, uh, stop yeah. sharing your I think screen. there's some problem. Is you it have to go and no? share screen thing and then you can stop sharing. Is it? Is it now? Okay. Oh. Let me see if I can. Uh, let me share my screen in a moment. Where is the desktop? Yes, I'll take just a brief minute, okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. Meetings. I don't want to uh, show everything, but just a few things. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, so can you see this slide now? No, sir. Yeah? No, sir. No, no. Okay, let me... Gaurav, sir, your screen is uh, sharing still. So no, you have to stop to... sharing. I think uh, let me do. I'll do one thing. I'll leave the meeting and join. Can I? Can you see my slide you now? No, sir. No. So yes. when? But you see Goro slides? Yes, sir. Now we can see. You can see my slide now. Yes, sir. Okay, fine. So. Just a moment. Let me make it a full screen. So, yeah. So, Gaurav and other uh, delegates, this is the portable hip spica table which we are going to give as a gift to all the early bird registrants. Now, there is an acrylic sheet as you can see on the top which is fairly thick. So, when you remove it, there is enough space around tummy and there is space underneath. The pillar's height is about... Uh, 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 six inches so it is very easy to wrap plaster around and this is how it looks so you can take off the uh, top uh, acrylic sheet and then you can unscrew the pillars and it is just like this so you can carry this in your uh, bag uh, uh, very easily and so we are planning to pack it and give it to all the delegates which can be easily put in checked in baggage and if you want to uh, station it in your theater, you can get it welded, all the three pillars, which we do now. Or if you are doing practice at multiple places, you can take it and it can be easily mounted. So this is one thing. The second thing is uh, a hip spica stroller, which we have developed. And uh, that hip spica stroller also makes life very easy. You know, most of the time, uh, adult orthopedic colleagues and the patients, they are afraid of uh, hip spica because they fear that how we will take care of the child. So once we finish today's talk, if we have time, uh, Joyance would show you some pictures of hip spica stroller and how, how it works. So overall, Gaurav, that was a great talk. Yeah. So uh, just one, uh, like about your table, uh, till what age group we can use this table? Like uh, the, uh, Age like Say we important have weight, we have done weight. highest weight is of 50 kilograms. Almost an adult, huh? Ah, yeah, and yeah. one uh, yeah, the recently we did a DDH in a nine years old. There also we could mount this patient because this acrylic sheet is very thick and very uh, you know solid. Yeah. So we have tried it. 
most of our hip spike our children are uh, uh, or ddh up to 4 5 years they weigh up to 25 kg at the most so this can be used for all the children yeah jones we can go on for the next talk yes sir so the next talk will be by ashish sir on submuscular plating ashish sir you can share your screen Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Maulin and Joyans. It's a pleasure to be here. So, I'm going to talk about the technique of submuscular plating. Let's start straight away with the case. 11-year-old boy weighing 45 kgs while crossing the road got hit by a car. And this is the picture. And there are various ways to treat this, but um, we have been treating these fractures with Submuscular plating using uh, standard DCP, non-locking plate. So, in general, we do it supine on a fracture table. Uh, with traction, we reduce the fracture and maintain the reduction. And majority of the times, we use 4.5 millimeter narrow DCP, somewhere in the range 9 to 17. Very rarely, we have used 3.5 mm DCP. And we contour it on table, as we can see. So that's how we position the patient. We make sure that we, we get a good lateral view. Uh, that, that's why we are checking. We can see the proximal fragment, like DHS standard um, fracture table construct. That's the reduction. Uh, it is not, it is pretty well aligned, not perfect, but some uh, liability is OK. Uh, we can manage, we can maintain the alignment intraoperatively. Uh, so we make a distal incision, then we put a cop through to create a submuscular tunnel. It's extra periosteal plate. And we try to aim with the tip of the cop up to the greater trochanter. So here we start. Um, we are marking, we are marking the fracture site where the fracture is. And um, we will be marking the proximal incision and the distal incision. I'm marking how long the op oblique spiral fragments are proximally and distally. So Again, tip of the greater trochanter, I'm marking with the cob elevator. And then once I know where um, the fracture is, I take a DCP. Here I'm using a 4.5 mm narrow DCP, non-locking. I put it on the anterior surface. That is to give the length because then you know that how far distal you need to read. We aim to get at least three screws in distal and proximal fragments. Sometimes we have put four screws distally. So anterior surface, we use this split. It also gives us idea whether it is too broad or too narrow. But uh, rarely we need to use broad DCP. Majority of the times it's the narrow DCP, which we use for humerus. So it, it's looking pretty OK there so i'm happy with the position so i am seeing where first three holes might be and again i'm making that mark over there then i'm trying another plate to see how far distally it is reaching and then i decide which plate to go for so here we have used a uh, 12 hole dcp then we put it then we are making the marks on the lateral side, distal and proximal. Typically, it should be sufficient to access two or three screw holes in the plate. And then with the regular plate binder, we bend the proximal end of the plate so that it fits against the flare of the greater trochanter. So this is possible because we are using a non-locking plate and we can bend it as, as much as we want. So 
So that is to accommodate the flare of the greater drop angle. So now our implant is ready. That's how it looks. Okay. So now, um, yeah, I'm sorry. It's displaying. Yeah. So you can see my resident is making, he'll be making distal incision first and then the proximal incision. Here we go through skin, tensor fascia lata and gently divide the costus. We do not split periosteum. Creating a tunnel. And then creating space for the plate and is sliding it proximally to create the tunnel for the plate. Okay, so that's how it looks. You can see the tip of the cob reaching into the proximal fragment. We are not trying to strip any periosteum. We are just creating space for the plate to go along. Here he is going slightly anterior. So I am going to redirect that and go more laterally. And then once we palpate the tip, we make the proximal incision. Oh, wow. And we, we go right up to the muscle and split it. And we know that there is enough space for that plate. Okay, so it is again creating, it's connecting those two tunnels from proximal and the distal end. Okay, so now with the, with a cocker, we slide that plate and create some space distally and we put uh, a bone spike or home on so that we can see the end of the plate. All right, now once the plate is in, now it is not fitting very perfectly on the bow, but now I'm going to temporarily fix it proximally and distally. So we are using K wires into the holes of the plate for temporary fixation. You will see on the CR that that's the position. So we are happy about the position. And after this, we go distally and put another K wire for temporary fixation of the plate. Okay, so we are happy with the position of the plate. You can see two K wires, one in the proximal and distal fragment. And now we will be putting the screw. So usually we put distal screw, but here we are putting the proximal screw first in the second hole of the proximal fragment. It's a non-locking plate. So again, we have checked the lateral view. It, it looks okay. We are checking the length and then Okay. So we have put screw proximally. Then we are coming distally. Again, we can see the end of the plate. And you can see two screws proximally, and that's the reduction. And now we are putting the distal screw. It's a non-locking screw, which we have put in. And that is bringing that plate 
closer to the bow. That's how it looks. We take pictures, AP and lateral view at this. And we thought the, the alignment is pretty reasonable. So we decided to go ahead with the rest of the screws. So, so that is like just filling in the blanks. So we are putting in screws proximally and distally. So excuse me, here we are putting in three screws in the proximal fragment and distal fragment. So that's how it looks. We got three screws distally and we are putting the third screw in the proximal fragment. So that is good alignment. Then we close it in subcriticular fashion. And that's how it looks at six weeks. Post op protocol is we do not use any immobilization. We keep them non weight bearing till we see early callus. We typically start knee range of movements at around 10 days. And the child starts walking with crutches or a walker. That's how it looked six weeks. So at that point, we started toe touch weight bearing and gradually progressed to full weight bearing. So that's full union at three months. Alignment looks satisfactory. It's healed well. And uh, we did implant removal at one year. Uh, we have published this in JPOB recently. So another example, I do not have video for this, but I think that for these kind of fractures, 11 year old girl with comminuted subtroke weighing 57 kilos, uh, this technique was used. So again, reduction on fracture table and I'm just aligning the fragments with help of an artery or clamp and then sizing the plate. Again, I have used a narrow DCP 4.5 system and that's the post-op x-ray. That's how it looked at six weeks you can see that there is slight gap over there and it looks like a slight angulation, but that is very much acceptable at this age. That's how it was at three months. At that point, she started walking full weight bearing. Then she lost to follow for a while and came back after four and a half years when everything looks healed well. Uh, I offered her implant removal, but she's not ready for that. So she's continued to do well. Um, there is probably less than 10 degrees apex anterior deformity, but that is very acceptable. And she does not have any functional or cosmetic problems. So thanks. Any questions? Ashish, uh, have you, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Is there any incidence of uh, restriction of range of motion uh, in your series or they all have full range of motion? Yes. So all of them, uh, they had full range of motions. Uh, some kids, two kids, they we need to work on them. They uh, Younger kid especially, um, they were a little slow to regain movements. It took them two months, more than two months, but none of them had any problems with range of motion. Mm -hmm. Now, another question is, uh, uh, is implant removal difficult or you do you need to extend your uh, pre-existing incision? It can be easily done through that. It can be easily done. Uh, typically, I recommend them implant removal at one year. And since it's a non-locking plate, stainless steel, implant removal is not a problem. Right. And because why I'm asking this range of motion, sometimes when you use a temporary X fix, you know, some there is sometimes there is tethering in the tensor fascia lata. Yeah. And again, they, they also improve that because we use only single pin proximal distal. Yeah. But sometimes they struggle to regain the range of motion. There's an excellent demonstration of technique. 
Yeah, and I'll One keep problem it in. Yeah. I found was uh, if the child is young and short, when the child cannot fit on a fracture table mm. to give that traction, then sometimes it's really challenging. Mm. That's right. So we need to kind of modify. I know I, I have modified my fracture table for yeah. the length, you know. The shorter length. Yeah. Of... yeah. So that was an excellent talk. I'll keep it in mind and we'll have it in POSI 25. Now I see everything in perspective of POSI 25, you know. Thank anyway. you. Yeah, Joanne, so you can take questions. Yes, uh, there is one question. Uh, Dr. Neeraj Joshi has asked, uh, same quality of reduction can be achieved with close nailing. So what is the advantage of submuscular plating over that? Yeah, so... Uh... Nailing classical indications are transverse mid-shaft fractures. So here we are talking of comminuted subtrochs or long oblique fractures, which are like extended indications for nailing. So there are various modifications of nailing that have been described, like stack nailing, driving through the GT or proximal to distal, or adding X-fix. So if you are using standard nailing, the principle of elasticity will work, but you need to supplement that with a Thomas Clint external fixator or spica cast. So here you don't need that kind of uh, uh, immobilization and malunion risk is reduced. But I agree, I mean, there is sort of no vis-a-vis um, -vis comparative study of nailing versus submuscular plating for subtrope fractures. So, uh, so Neeraj, right, this is one of the modalities which we can use. And uh, the fractures which communicated ones, a butterfly, big butterfly fragment, uh, there is a chance that you may, uh, you the fracture may collapse because at the fracture site, there's an, the canal is bigger than at the isthmus. And so there will not be a great uh, stability at the fracture site by using multiple nails. We have been uh, using Ender's nailing, jamming the canal from top, and that can also be used. But this is one of the modalities. Yeah. So that, that was nice talk. Uh, Jan, we can proceed for the next one. Yes, sir. Thank you. So we'll proceed to the uh, last talk. Vivek, sir, you can share your screen. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Molin, sir, and uh, Jayas, for this uh, uh, like opportunity for the lecture. Is my screen visible now? Yes, sir. Yeah, so the topic for my presentation is uh, pediatric femur shaft fractures uh, treated with a tense nailing, titanium elastic nailing system or elastic stable intramedullary uh, nailing. So the uh, indications have already been uh, described by uh, and explained by Dr. Gaurav Gupta. So we'll again go through once. So we'll go through it once. The ideal candidate for a tense is a, a child between the age of uh, six to eleven years with a length stable fracture, in with a fracture in the mid eighty percent of the diaphysis, uh, body weight of less than fifty kg, and the fracture pattern of uh, transverse or short oblique uh, fracture. So the, the treatment of choice would be uh, flexible uh, flexible intermedullary nails in a school going children. So there are certain uh, important uh, considerations while uh, doing TENS. It is an easy technique, but uh, if done wrong, it can uh, cause com serious complications like uh, malunion, non-union, uh, implant uh, back out, irritation. So let's go through some uh, important considerations. So the first is to understand the concept that uh, TENS nailing works on the principle of elastic stability. Elastic stability. Two pre-bent uh, elastic nails are inserted from either side of the metaphysis. The bend of the nails is more than what the canal can accommodate. The elastic recoil of the two nails stabilizes the fracture and uh, causes these four biomechanical properties, which gives a flexural stability uh, in varus valgus uh, direction, axial stability, translational stability, and rotational stability. So the, the principle is uh, can be correlated to a hairpin bend. 
so the we have gone through the, the correct indication so this is the second important consideration uh, choosing the right implant for the right age and the right fracture so uh, mid shaft uh, fractures short oblique are the uh, classical indications for this tense nailing uh, it can also be used in, uh, in certain uh, fracture uh, unique situations where these can be considered as uh, extended indications like subtrochantric fractures where it can be supplemented uh, along with a uh, uh, fixator uh, using a hybrid fixation or uh, it can also be used in length unstable fractures or comminuted fractures where you can uh, use a fixator for a hybrid fixation or you can supplement it with a cylinder cast and apply the uh, end caps. And in a supracondylar fracture, uh, fracture uh, the technique can be modified uh, using an anti-grade nailing from uh, proximal to distal and then supplemented with a cast. The third important point uh, to consider is the nail size and the bending principle. The nail size, uh, each nail is of uh, should accommodate at least 40% of the medullary canal. So we can uh, measure the inner uh, canal diameter on a uh, actual x-ray and uh, multiply it by 0.4 which gives us the size of the nail. Commonly the, the sizes which are used for femur are between 3 to 4 mm. And similar for tibia, while in the upper limbs uh, for humerus and radius ulna, we use uh, between 2 to 3 or 3.5 mm. So alternatively, uh, we can uh, use a, uh, we can put the nails on the patient's thigh and take a C-arm picture and uh, see the percentage of uh, canal that it occupies, both the nails. So the uh, same uh, same uh, diameter nails should be used to avoid any virus of uh, valgus angulation due to the, the sharing of the forces. Pre-bend the nails at the apex, uh, which should be at least three times the inner diameter of the canal. So the, the bend has to be done at the apex and it has to be a uniform bend. There should not be any kinking of the nail and the bending should start from the tip of the nail. And uh, symmetrical bending is uh, performed for both the nails uh, for a mid shaft fracture. So as we can see that uh, we can uh, put the nails on the uh, thigh of the patient, mark the fracture site and uh, that should be the apex of the spindle, uh, apex of the bend and uh, both the nails are bent before uh, starting the procedure. Uh, adequate entry point. So we should not hesitate to take a good incision for uh, making a uh, adequate entry point because we are close to the physis. Uh, we should take proper care to avoid any injury to the uh, facial plate. The ideal entry point is uh, one to two centimeter proximal to the distal uh, femur physis. So as we have we are seeing in the uh, diagram here. So uh, alternatively, one finger breadth above the superior pole of the patella or 1 to 2 cm proximal to the distal femur physis. That should be the entry point. And uh, we can mark with the uh, K wire uh, uh, passing transversely so that uh, we can get a similar entry point on the other side as well. The entry point is uh, taken at 90 degrees uh, with the awl and then uh, the 45 degree bend is taken to uh, direct it towards the medullary canal. So uh, the next important point is to the uh, to consider the advancement of the nails. We should uh, always uh, advance both the nails uh, together, and uh, we can use two chucks that are provided. One one can be the T handle, and the other one uh, which is provided with the uh, nail set. So once we enter the, the medullary canal, the uh, tip faces towards uh, in a perpendicular fashion. And then uh, we have to rotate it 180 degree to direct it towards the medullary canal. So once we uh, enter the uh, uh, lateral nail, we can then uh, pass on to the medial nail entry side. Uh, and then uh, we advance it uh, simultaneously. We care should be taken to not hammer uh, through the T handle and avoid rotation more than 180 degree to prevent uh, locking of the nails, which is also known as snaking of the nails. 
so coming to the reduction techniques uh, one can uh, use a traction table uh, to give the to reduce the fracture or we usually perform it on a supine uh, fracture supine uh, operative table since we have the, the help of uh, residents so uh, simple traction can align the fracture so i would like to pause for a minute Sorry, sir. Can we uh, see the screen again? Yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, we can use a traction table or uh, we can all uh, uh, also use a fracture on a supine operating table. In this, yeah. Just give me a minute. I think the screen is hanging. Yeah. The, alternatively, the we can use an F tool, which is a uh, which is a radio opaque instrument available in the ten snailing set. To reduce the fracture uh, in the anterior posterior as well as the medial lateral direction. Uh, at the last resort, we can uh, use a pin uh, to joystick the fragments or to guide the nails into the proximal fragment. And we can also use the ho uh, hockey stick bend as to direct uh, and make an entry into the fracture and then rotate the nail to align the fracture and advance the nails. So these are the reduction techniques that are uh, commonly used. One can easily go through each of the uh, reduction techniques and uh, achieve a good reduction. The next important point is to maintain the length, uh, axis and rotation at all times. So the uh, in length unstable fractures or comminuted fractures, the nail can easily back out causing uh, loosening or protrusion of the nails. In that situation, we can uh, use the end caps which are uh, provided with the set or uh, we can supplement the fixation of the nails with uh, uh, fixate, external fixator for a short uh, period of time. So uh, sharing an example where there is a uh, subtrochantric fracture of the femur and uh, it is a long spiral fracture as we can see on the first x-ray uh, in the AP as well as the lateral view. So in this uh, situation, uh, to prevent the shortening and uh, to prevent the nail back out, we can use the, the end caps which are helpful in maintaining the length. So this fracture went on to heal well. So coming to the hybrid fixation, uh, it has its own uh, indications where uh, uh, there is a length unstable fracture, segmental fracture or commutative fracture where you can uh, put the intramedullary nails to align the fracture and uh, to maintain the length we can use the hybrid fixator. Uh, the fixator can be removed by the, the period of uh, three to four weeks depending on the age. In younger children less than eight years we can uh, remove the fixator early at three weeks once a callus is seen or in uh, older children by the end of uh, six weeks we can remove the fixator. So the next important point to consider is the uh, rotations. Uh, during the procedure, we have to uh, uh, make sure the rotations are correct by looking at the tip of the nails and the uh, lesser trochanter. If the lesser trochanter is seen well, then the uh, proximal fragment seems to be rotated in the external rotation. So we need to revise the uh, reduction, uh, use a pin to uh, joystick the proximal fragment and put the nails again. So one such uh, 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 scenario where we can see there is a mal rotation of the left uh, 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 femur, the, there is a uh, exaggerated external rotation and restricted internal rotation. So this should be prevented uh, intraoperatively. 
so uh, coming to the uh, trimming of the nails once the uh, nails have been uh, seated in the metaphyseal region so the trimming of the nails is important because uh, it can cause complications if the nails are too proud if the nails are too long it can irritate the bursa and cause synovial inflammation and uh, prevent the knee flexion in uh, severe cases it may cause infection as well so ideally the nails are to be uh, cut flush to the cortex uh, we usually leave uh, 1 to 1 and a half centimeter nail outside the bone for easy removal and to prevent nail irritation so the uh, during the removal, uh, uh, it, it is important to remove the nails and for the upper limbs, we usually remove the nails between 6 to 9 months, whereas in lower limbs, we remove the nails between uh, 12 to 18 months. So various methods can be used uh, for removal of the nails uh, by using an extractor which is provided with the tense nail set. Alternatively, a hollow mill or a suction tube can be uh, passed over the tip of the nail bent at 90 degrees and uh, reverse hammer with a uh, by holding it with a plier and a hammer so we have uh, published this technique uh, we'll go through the removal so the nail tip is uh, bent uh, using a hollow mill and uh, held it held with a plier at 90 degrees and then reverse hammer so it uh, makes the uh, implant removal easier in uh, even in uh, difficult cases. So this is the uh, technique of uh, tense nailing. I would like to uh, uh, share a, a short video of uh, my guide, Dr. Sandeep Patwardhan. So this is the standard uh, OT setup where uh, we can uh, see the CM at a uh, uh, right angle to the OT table, the uh, uh, patient, uh, uh, the operative side is the, the left side and uh, the TV in front of the opposite side to the surgeon. So the short oblique uh, or a transverse fracture of the femur. And these are the uh, impl uh, instrument set which is required uh, for the procedure. The awl as well as the F tool, we can see the F tool here. And uh, the straight as well as the curved awls for entry point. So uh, first step is to uh, check for the diameter of the nails. See how much it uh, accommodates the medullary canal. So this is how we uh, look at the diameter of the nails and then mark the apex of the uh, spindle at uh, the fracture site. And a gentle curve is uh, given to the uh, gentle bend is given to the nail starting from the uh, apex of the fracture and then it is uh, uniformly uh, curved till the tip of the nail. Similar procedure is re uh, repeated for the second nail. The uh, bend of the nail should be the should be at three times the diameter of the uh, canal. and symmetrical bending of the nails. So after, uh, so this is how the entry point is made. Uh, first the entry is at the perpendicular direction and then curve it towards the medullary canal. And the first nail is inserted, bring it to the fracture side. Do not uh, advance the uh, single nail uh, beyond the fracture side. 
we should bring both the nails at the fracture site and then advance the nails. Similar procedure is repeated for the second nail. Yeah, so the, you know, we keep on advancing the nail. Both nails uh, should be advanced at simultaneously using two chucks. The assistant, one assistant can advance from the opposite side, bring it to the fracture side, both, uh, keep uh, both the nails at the fracture side and then perform your reduction uh, using uh, your reduction techniques with traction or uh, uh, you can use a F tool to maintain the reduction and then pass the nail. So we can uh, keep a uh, sheet below the uh, thigh to accommodate the procurvatum of the femur. So once we advance the nail, as we can see that the due to the uh, elastic uh, principle of the nail, it goes into valgus. If a lateral nail is inserted first, then it goes into valgus. If the medial nail is inserted, it goes into varus, which gets corrected once the second nail is inserted. So after uh, crossing the fracture side, uh, make sure the nails are sitting well in the metaphysis of the proximal femur. The medial nail can go as far as the neck while the lateral nail gets uh, stuck at the just below the greater trochanter. We check the alignment in the lateral position. So while uh, trimming of the nails, uh, we can either use a, a jumbo cutter or there is a one more instrument available uh, in the synthes set. Uh, but what we have seen is that using that uh, instrument from the synthes set, it keeps the nails longer. So we use this uh, method to trim the nails. So we hold the uh, nail uh, slightly bent and uh, cut as flush to the bone retract the skins properly so that there is no injury to the skin and then uh, we punch it with a hammer for proper seating of the nail. So as we can see, the spindle is uh, properly achieved at the fracture side with uh, two crossings, one uh, in the distal fragment and one in the proximal fragment and proper seating of the nails in the both the metaphysis, proximal as well as distal. At the last, uh, we uh, give some thumbs to achieve some compression and check, rotate, check for the rotations. So one such example of a case of a proximal femur fracture, sharp fracture, which was uh, treated with the similar tense technique, which went on to heal well. And a uh, second case of a, uh, uh, which was a previously also a treated uh, distal femur uh, sharp fracture. Uh, as we can see that the uh, fracture went into procurvatum and there was loosening of the K wires. 
which was uh, treated with the anti grade uh, 10 snailing, which also went on to heal well with the plaster as well as 10 snailing. The post operative immobilization protocol involves a uh, cast for at least three weeks. Uh, we can also use a, a long leg knee brace and uh, start with the knee range of motion. And we keep the child uh, non weight bearing for six weeks. And then uh, full weight bearing is completely achieved by the end of three months. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk and the technique. So there is one question uh, from uh, Dr. Praful. Uh, he has asked, does it, uh, we bend the, pre-bend the nails. So he has asked, does it not unbend while you are putting it and pushing in the medullary canal? So uh, it, uh, uh, if we uh, put the uh, uh, bent nail in the chuck uh, till the uh, till the tip, it, tri it, uh, it tries to unbend. So make sure that uh, you keep the uh, bent part of the nail outside the chuck for uh, easy insertion. But if you have uh, properly bent the nail uh, for three times the diameter, so that's why we uh, uh, bend the nail more than the canal so that it can accommodate that much bend. And usually it doesn't uh, unbend on its own. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, as of now, there are no other questions. So thank okay. you, sir, for the talk. Mm, so we'll conclude today's session. Uh, Uh, next week, we'll meet again for uh, techniques in leg and ankle fractures. Uh, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek. It was a nice talk. Thank, thank you. Sir. Thank thank you. Sir. Take care. Bye, sir.